The financial world is waking up to climate change, but is it moving fast enough? Havan Sukhdev, a former managing director at Deutsche Bank, has warned about the threat for well over a decade. When we lose biodiversity, we lose some of ourselves. He's now president of advocacy group WWF International and CEO of Just Impact, a sustainability consulting firm. On this episode of Influencers, Pavan joined me to talk about the rise of ESG investing, environmental concerns over cryptocurrency. It's not a currency, it's an asset. And whether banks and corporations are walking the talk on climate. Hello and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer and welcome to our guest, Pavan Sukhdev, who is president of the Conservation Advocacy Group, Worldwide Fund for Nature, or WWF International, you all know the panda, and CEO at Gist Impact, a sustainability consulting firm. Pavan, welcome. Thank you, Andy. Good to be with you. So why don't we start off with a basic question. What type of work does WWF International do, and how is it funded? WWF is funded by you, I should say. I mean, we have more than 6 million donors and largely families and, uh, of course, also institutions as well as some companies. So it's a very wide mix, but more than half is just individuals and families. What we do is to ensure that nature and people thrive and that we do that by engaging policymakers, engaging corporations, engaging people and uh, working closely with conservation agencies and and. Uh, uh, with other arms of government and society to ensure that we, as in people, continue to thrive together with nature. I mean, that sounds like a, a very large remit. What are the priorities? Uh, we, we basically look at um, three key drivers. So we find that a lot of the losses of nature are happening as a result of drivers like markets, market forces and finance moving in the wrong directions or in, inadequately in the right directions and governance and policy is going wrong at some point or the other. These typically, these drivers lead to outcomes which are typically in food systems, which are very big outcomes of these drivers and the nature of those, and then climate change. And those in turn affect forests and they affect water, freshwater systems and they affect the ocean. And at the end of the day, species suffers, so wildlife suffers. So we realize that these three drivers and these two outcome areas and the four areas of nature uh, which are the impact areas as we call it actually all need expertise and they all need guidance from people who are working in the interests of society civil society and that's who we are we are basically working in each of these areas applying our expertise in many different countries where we operate all the way from the united states to new zealand i really want to drill down uh, more into the work that you guys are doing but first i mentioned the panda at the top so that's a very famous logo and then your name you kind of had a dust up with the wrestling organization in the United States, but you ended up winning. Can you tell, talk to us about both those things? Isn't that amazing? The, this WWF won against the World Wrestling Federation. Well, actually, uh, we were born 60 years ago. This is our 60th anniversary, and it was WWF, and it was the Panda logo and, and, and the brand, WWF. And then somewhere along the line comes the World Wrestling Federation. And we said, oh, my gosh. Uh, and then because we couldn't persuade them to change the names, we took them to court and we won. It's amazing. Um, let me ask you uh, about where we are with the pandemic and COVID-19 and what has been the impact of that on the work that you do? Well, it's it's been mixed, to be honest. So firstly, uh, COVID-19 is a huge tragedy and uh, 4 million people dying as a result of what is effectively, we think, mismanaged mismanagement of the interaction between people and nature again. So it's about it's a question of a virus being transmitted from the animal kingdom due to mismanagement into other animals and then from there into humans. Um, this is huge. And I think this is at one level, if you like, the silver lining is that it has led people to understand how important it is to look after nature. Um, but the flip side is that, honestly, conservation work on the ground suffers. Our people have suffered. It is really difficult to work in areas where the risk to our, our 8,000 employees is significant. And managing things remotely and long distance is, is very difficult. So therefore, um, harmful activities like illegal uh, 
poaching and and uh, and destruction of natural areas and forests and wetlands has continued apace and wildlife crime has increased so you know there are costs to there are costs to this this exercise Pavan, you mentioned the fact that um the the um the virus may have come from a mismanagement of uh, the relationship between animals and humans. And I guess you're referring to a wet market, um, potentially, we, we're not sure. Um, is this something that you guys are, are working to mitigate wet markets? Is that under your purview? I think most broadly, what we are trying to create is uh, an appreciation of the fact that um, Humans grow animals and we consume them and that's fine. But when it comes to wild animals, we just do not understand enough. I mean, we just do not understand enough the, the life of these animals and the viruses that they contain perfectly harmlessly, so long as they are left in their natural habitat. And we are trying to create that awareness that, look, if we somehow try to limit our access to nature in a way that is not harmful, then in fact, we can reduce the risk to ourselves as humans as well. So that education is part of what we are trying to, to push across. And of course, working with policymakers. So our operations in China do have worked with the Chinese government and introduced, and the Chinese government has, of uh, sometime last year, introduced tighter controls on wet markets, on wildlife crime, and so on. So I, I believe the message is getting across. But of course, there's a long way to go. WWF International's Living Planet Index has shown an average 68% decrease in population sizes of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and fish between 1970 and 2016. What are the implications of that biodiversity loss? You see, what, what we forget is that when we lose biodiversity, we lose some of ourselves. Ecosystem services, uh, which is all the benefits that are delivered by ecosystems, by species and by genes. And by that, I mean ecosystem benefits like absorbing carbon from the atmosphere to prevent climate change or providing uh, fresh water into the through evapotranspiration to provide rainfall, which feeds agriculture. These are some of the benefits of nature at the ecosystem level. Then there are benefits at the species level, like the pollination of bees. It's highly valuable to the economy. It basically is estimated as as almost 12% of the value of agricultural output is essentially the pollination of bees. And you can tell that between good bee years and bad bee years and how much it costs and what is the output difference. So these things are benefits at species levels. And of course, you know, at the genetic level, genetic diversity ensures our resilience against disease. So all of these benefits are given to us by nature for free. You know, mm -hmm. when did a bee ever send you an invoice? Mm -hmm. So. So the, the fact is, if we don't uh, recognize this and internalize this understanding, then we end up making careless decisions, not valuing what we receive for free, simply because it doesn't trade at a price. Mm, yeah, concerns markets, which is market forces potentially, which is a fascinating uh, thing to consider here. Now, your organization has warned about both how food production threatens biodiversity and how biodiversity loss ultimately threatens food security. What does that feedback loop look like? It, it, is, it, it is a very worrying feedback loop. So, um, of course, uh, food systems, as I mentioned, in addition to climate, are two of the main areas which drive losses in ecosystems and biodiversity. And how we produce food, in other words, is it uh, harmful on adjacent ecosystems? Is it are we using ex excessive pesticides and fertilizers leading to damage in soil biodiversity, that, which in turn leads to damage in avian biodiversity, which in turn leads to damage in, in entire ecosystems? Uh, is it that kind of agriculture or is it mild and defensive agriculture, what we call natural farming and so on? So what kind of agriculture is there? So we try and educate, again, uh, people and policymakers on, on the alternatives that are available. And in fact, there are many successful stories. We have uh, a food practice, as we call it, a knowledge practice, which focuses on food systems and how important they are. And then there's the other side to it, which is the the uh, biodiversity that is in nature, whether it's the pollination of bees or whether it's the diversity of crops that can come in and replace lost crops. This happened in rice, by the way, it actually happened. A lot of the Asian rice was affected by a disease and it was in fact the availability of fresh strains of rice, which were reintroduced by the uh, the uh, Rice Research Institute in the Philippines that in fact saved the Asian rice population. And of course, it's the main food in, in Asia. So th there are many benefits of this kind 
coming from nature into food systems. And the resilience of food systems truly depends on nature. So that's a key part of the cycle, completing the cycle. Keep nature there so that her ability to provide resilience to food systems is maintained. And that's, the, if you like, the virtuous cycle that we hope will ensue. Fascinating. And I have so many more questions. But let me ask you about WWF a little bit. So how many people work there? How many countries do you operate in? I don't know if you talk about your annual budget, but if so, I'm curious about that as well. Well, we receive hundreds of millions of dollars of, of donations from people all around the planet. Um, and uh, we have a staff around the planet. We have uh, basically 30 what we call national organizations. In other words, organizations which have their own independent decision making and board, but within the fabric and the context of WWF globally. Uh, and then we have another 70 locations where we have uh, project offices or program offices and another few countries where we operate programs. So it's altogether about 110 countries where WWF is physically present in some form or the other. Um, so it's it's a huge organization and, and uh, our staff are truly committed. I really am delighted and very, very humbled uh, to be uh, to be helping them in my board position as president. And I know you're based in, in Switzerland. And but there are other global um, environmental NGOs, of course, and I wonder how is WWF different? Do you work with them, other other entities, and do you work with, um, say, the United Nations as well? Yeah, no, we don't. In fact, uh, as as I say very often, you know, nobody, uh, we don't, and nobody succeeds in splendid isolation. And uh, the reality is that uh, when when I visit our our offices, and and whether it is you know, in, in Australia or, or whether it is in, in Guyana, I find remarkable collaborations happening on the ground. And I, I've even attended, I still remember an event in Guyana, which, you know, was co-hosted by Conservation International and WWF and the United Nations altogether. Mm -hmm. So this is fairly typical. And, and this is the kind of pattern that makes success happen because everyone brings their own skills and strengths and supporters and, and voices. And I think that that resonates with policymakers and resonates with business. So I think that's certainly certainly the way that we, we like to operate. And, you know, we have many, many and deep relationships with collaborators on the ground and globally. Obviously, ESG and the environment is being recognized more and more as a critical issue. Have you seen this and what does that do to your thinking about your work? Well, it, it reinforces our thinking. I mean, we've, the, the reason why many years ago, in fact, before my time as president, uh, the, the group decided that we must build knowledge expertise in these what we call the drivers areas, finance and markets and governance, was because we realized the importance of getting finance right. If the wrong projects and the wrong businesses get supported and the right ones do not, we have the wrong economy. If we have the wrong economy, we have the wrong impacts. And that's where the ESG comes in. ESG knowledge and ESG analysis helps banks and investors to understand what's a good and a bad uh, proposition from the point of view of sustainability. In other words, is this going to only make profits for the company, but create huge social damage to nature, to, to people, to human health? Or is it going to be a plus plus? Is it going to be a, 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 a you know, what we call a win-win situation where there are four areas, right? There's human capital, knowledge, skills and health. There's social capital, which is all your relationships and society. Then there's natural capital. Of course, that's a central concern uh, for people like us. And then there's produced capital, which is the economy. So what we say is that a truly sustainable enterprise or a company is only which it's plus, 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 right? Because it doesn't matter whether there's 10 of you or 10,000 or 10 million of you, society will only be better off as a result. Just Impact is your sustainability consulting firm. Who are your typical clients and what are their top concerns? Well, uh, GIST Impact has gone through uh, a couple of pivots, as the, the, the language is nowadays, <laughs> over the last couple of years. One was that we were largely uh, facing off with corporations and we would be approached for solving complex problems. So, you know, what is the impact of from a client? What is the impact of um, underground sewage treatment plants versus overground on property prices? Can we do this even though it's better for the environment? Or what is the valuation of biodiversity in these forests that we have in Sweden? Or what is the value of ecosystem services like carbon sequestration? This was an actual question asked to us by Sviaskog, which is the largest Swedish forest owner. 
What's the value of our carbon storage and sequestration? Are we actually storing or are we releasing? And if we are capturing, which we believe we are, how much? And what's its worth? So we were asked questions like that. So we were very much in the consulting phase where we did research and provided answers. And at some point we realized that these answers would be much more valuable and would reach across to many more people if we could put them onto a platform. And that's exactly what we did. So we've converted our knowledge into a, a, a platform and we've started offering that out. And we have our first six, eight uh, paying clients who are sort of what we call co-creators. They're helping us improve the platform. And our next pivot came actually at uh, uh, my at the Davos meeting in 2020, where I realized that most of the people who were listening to us in a in an announcement event for this system that I just described, were actually not corporations, they were investors. Because mm. investors had understood that today's externalities are tomorrow's risks and are tomorrow's losses. And if you are sitting on a large portfolio, you don't want negative alpha hidden and tucked in there somewhere because it's going to come home to roost. And especially if you're a private equity fund, right? If you're taking on a, a new set of companies in your fund, you don't want to know about the negative externalities uh, in year eight or year nine of a 10 year horizon. You want to know about them today. So you need to know the externalities of your investees before you start with them. And that's really important. So people are, are getting the gist of this and the investors are in a sense driving a transformation of understanding of the importance of recognizing, measuring and managing those externalities, those negative externalities of corporations. Negative alpha, you are speaking the language of uh, Wall Street and hedge funds and New York City with which our audience is very familiar. So let me ask you, how do companies balance their bottom line and environmental impact? You know, what I've, I've learned through uh, my experience with our corporate clients, and I'm beginning to learn, of course, more quickly with my experience with our investor clients, is that actually companies do understand that there is a value in sustainability. And it comes from companies, it comes in four ways. One is that today's externalities are tomorrow's risks and some government is going to basically, you know, put a rule against it. So you could end up having a cost. So you're avoiding risks, you're managing your 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 tomorrow's risks and therefore day after tomorrow's cost. So there's a cost avoidance logic to it. The other is as you get more energy efficient and resource efficient in the pursuit for sustainability, you actually reduce your input costs as well. So not only do you manage your risk and your losses, but you manage your input costs as well. And thirdly, because you're thinking like that, you're looking for new sectors, new segments, millennial audiences for your products, you're thinking of new technology. How do I do this differently so that I can reduce my carbon footprint or my air pollution footprint or my water footprint? How do I do this? That creates, trust me, it creates a culture of innovation in the company. And it's amazing to see how that works. When you see the companies, the young people in the companies actually thinking of solutions, saying, hey, we could do it this way or the other way. And that's really great for companies. It creates that culture of innovation and enterprise. So these are some things. And of course, the other thing it does, which I think companies around the world have begun to understand and CEOs have begun to understand and share with me is that it creates loyalty, brand and loyalty. You, you improve your profile in the market and you get young people committed to you for no reason except that you, are, you have the same belief system. Like them, you believe in sustainability and that's a good thing. Yeah, we definitely see a generational shift or a differentiation between the generations. Right. You mentioned investing, Pavan, and I'm Curious about the rise of ESG investing per se. Uh, are the major institutional players embracing it quickly enough? What are the opportunities? So Andy, there's two sides to it really, right? What, what we hear a lot about and the nice stories that you hear are basically about what's known as impact investing, in, impact investing, which is like, you know, here's a new solar technology, here's a new hydrogen technology, it's gonna solve the problems and you'll have another Tesla. Right? So that's, if you like, impact investing in a very simple, simplified way. But there's another side to it, which is investing impact, the impact that any investment has, which means take a look at your portfolio. OK, if it's got too much in the nature of oil companies or mining companies, then you may be creating negative impacts, in other words, externalities. So the way I put it is that, look, uh, I love to hear about impact investing and all the stories and, and you know, the beautiful success stories and which I keep coming across and that's great. But what I also like to hear about is investment impact because actually when the investor markets truly understand and recognize externalities, then all investing will be impact investing because by definition, they're looking at the impact before they make the investment. 
I'm curious your take on the carbon per se. I mean, that's such a huge subject. I mean, the EU has proposed um, carbon tariffs on goods from countries that are large carbon emitters. Um, there's been some talk of that in the United States as well. Is that a good idea? Um, you know, carbon markets and carbon taxes are two sides to the same coin in the sense that these are alternative ways of ensuring that polluters pay. And carbon is a form of pollution, which, as you know, uh, a lot of work has been done by the US EPA and, and, and by, before that, and at the same time by the Stern Review uh, of Climate Change. So we know that there is a huge economic cost to greenhouse gas emissions, which comes home at some point in time, not immediately, but it could come later, a year later, a decade later. But um, these these are are the externalities. So I think we need to recognize that uh, climate change is a result of unmanaged externalities, and we need to do what we can to address it. So I guess this is this is at the heart of it all. I believe the two ways of doing that is taxation or uh, pricing, basically giving companies budget so that they have to manage within those budgets. And then that leads those who don't meet the budgets to purchase carbon credits and cover them through another cost. I actually believe taxation is more efficient compared mm. to others. So I, I think it's not a bad thing. And frankly, look at what we are doing these days. When we tax, our tendency in governments nowadays is to tax the goods and not the bad. So uh, innovation and enterprise in companies, corporation tax, right? So you're mm. basically taxing a good thing that you want, but you're taxing it because it leads to profits. Hard work from employees, salaries, income tax. Hello. I mean, do you want to encourage hard work or do you want to discourage hard work? What is it that you want to do? Figure it out. Whereas when we come to resource usage and resource emissions, basically pollution and, and uh, especially the use of the atmosphere, it's a limited space. You can only pollute it with so much carbon dioxide. We should be taxing that. That's resource use, the resource of the atmosphere. But we don't do resource taxation. We hardly, hardly anyone does it. We're always taxing the goods and not enough taxing the bads. So I believe this doesn't make sense. We should do it the other way around. Yeah, I've never heard it framed that way. That's a fascinating take, and I agree with it. Well, I'm going to tax the bad stuff. Sure, give me a tax cut and tax the polluters. I love it. I'm sure everyone would. What, what is your assessment of President Biden's record on climate um, throughout his career and so far as president? Well, I think, I think uh, President Joe Biden has been very, very sort of uh, sensitive to the risks of climate change and the need for policy to integrate climate change. So he's been conscious, conscious of that and he's been, uh, you know, sort of supporting uh, democratic and, and other initiatives on this front for a very long time. And uh, what I can see is that he is uh, creating the space, he's creating the fiscal space within the United States and also creating some of the policy levers that you need to pull to move the economy into what is known as a green economy, basically one where uh, innovation and enterprise actually invests in new technologies and in and new opportunities, you know, whether it is um, networks uh, around the country which distribute electricity or enable electric powered cars to work or whether it's hydrogen cells, whatever it is. I and mean, basically look at ways of changing energy use so that you do not end up burdening uh, the atmosphere with more carbon risk because it's already happening. I mean, there are countries you know, uh, Kiribati, for instance, a small island state in the Pacific, has literally had itself cleft in half. I mean, basically, they are so uh, close to the ocean that climate change has led to storms and cyclones essentially breaking the island, creating uh, a disaster out there. And so we, and by the way, most of humanity li lives at the coast, um, you know, wh whether it's in, in New York or Maine or wherever you are. Uh, you, you are close to the ocean and sometimes you're dangerously close for climate change. And remember, it's not just the millimeters of sea level rise. Every few millimeters of sea level rise means that storms and cyclones, floods and droughts have a massively greater impact in terms of the ingress of that water into the into inland areas. That affects coastal communities in developing countries where agriculture takes place close to the coast. So the impacts are tremendous. And I think uh, whatever uh, President Biden is is working on, I think is, is should be supported. I want to ask you about Bitcoin. Does the environmental impact of Bitcoin worry you? And Elon Musk has been going back and forth on this. And I wonder what your take is. I I, I would I tend to agree with Elon Musk on 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 this uh, issue. Uh, I think Bitcoin. To be honest, I mean, uh, Bitcoin's a—it's not a currency; it's—it's it's an asset, right? So it's basically—it's 
when you have something that is as volatile as Bitcoin, which goes you know down from sixty thousand to uh, whatever thirty thousand and back up to forty thousand in the span of short periods, as we saw a couple, last couple of days ago, it was up ten thousand from thirty to forty. I mean, imagine if you were buying and selling your daily shopping with a dollar in your wallet, which went up and down in value 10, 20, 30 percent every day. I mean, how happy would you feel with that? So I don't see Bitcoin as, a, as, a, as an alternative currency, but I do see it as a speculative store of value like gold or whatever. So, in fact, even more speculative than that. Right. Activist shareholders have pushed Exxon to take incremental steps towards sustainability. What do you make of that? And is that a model for other companies? No, that that's been a that's been um, a uh, a form of reaction by civil society that's been going on for quite some time, and I think it's it is helpful to remind uh, boards and to remind chair to remind executives, chief executives that you know they have a responsibility to the society in which they operate, not only. So they are. I think we are seeing a lot of talk these days about moving from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, as they call it. Uh, but it's essentially about recognizing that you know a company is not just a machine that makes money for shareholders. It's also the world's most important institution, with respect to the to the Vatican and everybody else. But basically, this is two thirds of the economy in the U.S. where you are. It's three fourths of the economy, right? So we have to respect that, and we need to recognize that something that big needs to be conscious of its role in society, and not just for its few shareholders. Evan, I want to ask you a little bit about you. You were born in India, moved to Switzerland in high school and later England. How did you get into this line of work? You were a banker too, right? Yeah, that's right. I've had a few pivots, if I may use the, <laughs> the language of startups in my own life. So I began as a scientist, actually. I was a physicist and read physics and astrophysics at Oxford University and at some point got interested in making money and got myself a job in finance, uh, which seemed to be a bright idea in those days. And then and did that. Um, and then somewhere along the line, my study of economics, which was for my finance uh, finance work, led me to understand that externalities need not, need not be just ignored. I mean, externalities are basically the third party costs of doing business as usual. They are huge. We are talking about trillions of dollars of costs being inflicted. And uh, our economist friends were doing nothing about them and business wasn't paying much attention to them either. So this became a passion for me, and that led to my work in my um, research work, and then led to the creation of GIST and my work with the United Nations on the economics of ecosystems, basically recognizing the invisible value that nature delivers to the economy. So I mean, you sort of have your foot, obviously, in the world of finance, and then obviously in, in the environment as well. So what are the one things, or what are some of the things that each side doesn't understand about each other? I'd, I'd say that um, the world of finance is only just beginning to understand um, two things, actually. One is the nature of value and the other is the value of nature. Right. Hmm. And let me just spend a moment commenting on each. The nature of value finance financiers, including sorry, myself when I was younger, uh, would focus on economic value, but not realize that financial capital, produced capital is actually Actually, one of four capitals, natural, human, social, and financial capitals. So there is this tendency in the world of finance to think only of the, the capital that you are most involved in on a day-to-day -day basis, which is financial capital. So that is in understanding the nature of value. Please understand that there are values, there are four other kinds of there are three other kinds of capitals as well. And the, the second is the sheer size of the value that nature delivers to the economy. I mean, the, the, there was some work done by the World Economic Forum recently. They published that something like $44 trillion of economic value come to the economy from nature, directly and indirectly. And uh, that not, that's, does not surprise me because we keep forgetting how much is delivered for free, but which is still valuable because nobody has put in the effort to, to recognize the economic value of what's delivered. It can be intermediate value addition in the GDP calculus. It can be just totally invisible if it's directly, you know, if it's, if it's your enjoyment of the beautiful forest that you are in, in, in Maine, yeah, you'd pay for being there. You, you probably are paying for being there. And it's, it's something that is delivered by the forest for free. Right? Right. So there's value in all of these deliveries of, of benefits which don't transact in a marketplace. Just because they don't transact in a marketplace, our tendency is to ignore them. 
because we are so fixated, we are so mesmerized by the magic of markets. And by the way, this is an ex-markets person saying this to you, right? So we are so mesmerized by the magic of markets that we keep forgetting that there's value elsewhere as well. Most of the voices and perspectives when it comes to addressing climate change come from the developed world and from the global north. What can we do to include perspectives and voices from the developing world and the global south? Well, I hope some of that is beginning to happen with, uh, if we look at the a recent piece of uh, good initiative was the forming of something called the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosure. The Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosure is, been, is an initiative designed to get the financial sector to start recognizing its impacts on nature, just the same way as the Task Force for uh, uh, Climate-Related Financial Disclosure was doing that for climate. So I think the, the ability of the world of finance to understand better, to understand nature better is, is improving. And I think this, this initiative will certainly be a step in that direction, a very good step in that direction. We believe that if we look at the composition of the task force, there's Elizabeth Marema, who's from Africa, and David Craig, who's from Refinitiv, uh, ex-CEO of Refinitiv. And um, we believe that this kind of task force will oblige investors and banks to look at the developing world as well and to see what is the value of nature in those economies and in those societies because it'll be starting to be reported banks will have to report it companies will have to report it and i think that'll really focus the mind on how significant is the gdp of the poor uh, which is nature because nature is delivering a lot to the society especially in the developing world if we look at if we look at the the nutrients and the fresh water that come to the fields of poor farmers or the the value that they get from just gathering you know timber and fuel wood and and rattan and whatever else they gather from their forests nearby it's huge it's a big part of their their household incomes and again this is invisible right we don't calculate it we don't capture it so these are some of the issues that will come up to the fore as a result of the increasing efforts to measure and disclose nature's values and final question, Pavan, what would you like your legacy to be? My legacy, gosh, that's... I think if, if I could somehow convince all companies that are significant, if I could convince all corporate leaders to measure and manage not just their impacts on financial capital belonging to shareholders, but also their impacts on human capital belonging to employees and others, on natural capital belonging to future generations and on social capital which is belonging to society if i could make leave behind a world which in which companies consider it normal to measure their impacts not just on one capital but on all four capitals i'd die a happy man Pavan sukdev president of wwf international thank you so much for your time thank you andy great to be with you you've been watching influencers I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.